Angela Yee on a Wealth of Wednesday, my favorite day. And I got my girl Stacey Tisdale, my partner, with me. Her partner in crime. And happy Wealth Wednesday, everybody. And this is a special one. Yes, it is. This is a very special one because we are joined by the one, the only, the amazing Arlen Hamilton. Hey, thank you. Who <laughs> is, um, how would you even start by describing Arlen? Okay, she's totally... <laughs> broken her way into Silicon Valley and mm -hmm. is a star in the technology world, which for a black woman, let's not even talk about how hard that is. She's the founder of Backstage Capital and has raised $30 million to help over 200 underestimated people start businesses. I can't wait to talk about that. She's all over the place right now. I think she's, a she's an Hall. author. Let's not forget that. She's an that. author. She has a new book out, Your First Million, and she's not leaving here until Angela and I know how to make our next million. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just an incredible, just so proud of you and all that you've accomplished. Thank and you so much. It's so inspiring when you know your story, which I will shut up and let you tell us your story. But mm -hmm. folks, this lady sitting right here next to me mm -hmm. was homeless. She was on food stamps into her 30s. And now she has changed the world. How the mm -hmm. heck did that happen, woman? <laughs> well, how much time do you have? <laughs> well, yeah, thank you so much. First of all, I want to say like that was a mic drop that you said just now. And I don't want us to miss that. Their next million. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure we heard all, all heard that. I know. Uh, Go ahead, Stacey, yes, with your millions. Yes. <laughs> next next show. We'll talk more about that. And I do, uh, before you tell your story, I want to say that I have been following you for years, so I'm oh, excited to have you up here as well. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like we have been in each other's orbit a lot. I f kind of mm -hmm. feel that. Um, so this is a really, this is a big honor to be here, so I appreciate it. Uh, how did it happen? Well, yeah, I was um, at 34, I'm 43 now, 34, I found myself living at the airport in San Francisco, and I had been working on this fund, this venture capital fund for three years, and just not, you know, knocked on doors, wasn't getting anywhere, but I was really keeping up with the founders and their stories and what they were building, and I think that was a big key to this, because when opportunity did come, I was ready. I didn't skip a beat, and so, I mean, there's, there's pr prior to that, I had started, I wanted to start a company once I understood what startups were, because mm -hmm. I've always been starting companies my whole life, but not knowing enough about it to make it work. So I always started and then they would fail, started and they would fail. And then finally I was like, I'm going to start a tech company because I kind of understand it. But then I read in 2013 or so a statistic that changed everything for me, which was that less than 10% of venture funding goes to anyone who's not a white man in right. the U.S. That's not to say that every white man gets venture funding. It's but just to say... the money that's available, that's who it goes to. And then not just that, but let's talk about black women. How yeah, much... It, you can't even see us on the blip. We're not even on, mm -hmm. the, on the radar. And when I learned that, I was like, wait a second. Well, I'm a black gay woman in the United States. I know my value. I know what I can accomplish if I, I could probably try to, you know, raise a million dollars for my company, but then what? Like, what happens next if they're not even seeing me or checking for me? And then what about my peers? Is it just going to be me walking through that door? So I thought, what if instead of trying to raise for one company, I could raise for several companies a fund and be a check writer so that when I was screaming and yelling about this, it wouldn't just be some angry black woman that they were going to try to peg me as. I was going to be an angry black woman who also could write a check. <laughs> and that's amazing to to not just be thinking about yourself, right, mm -hmm. but also as you're trying to raise money for yourself, how do I raise money yeah. for other people as well? Because you identified something that was a necessity yeah. uh, because we don't have that opportunity. And this goes back to when you talk about radical belief. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we talk ourselves out of things because it doesn't seem possible. But for you, even with the obstacles that you've overcame, you knew that this was something that could be possible. How yeah. did you get that? I was just looking around, and I mean, you have to understand, at that time, I was in, back in Texas, where, I, where I'm from, and I was living out of a hotel room with my mom before I even got it to the, to the airport. And we had nothing. Like, we would wait until Tuesdays when they had free chili days at the hotel because we were like, oh, we get to eat that day, you know? So we had really nothing. But I was just also studying all of these companies I would just go online or I would get in touch with somebody that I liked their company. And I just thought, these are hidden figures. These are like brilliant mm -hmm. people. 
And they cannot even get into a room with an investor. They can't even have the conversation. It is like they were not even written into this story at all. And to me, it was like if I could change that, do anything to change that, spend hyper focus on changing that, I could change the world. And it just it just became this. I call it a, a calling rather than a dream. Mm-hmm. I had had dreams before, and I would race towards dreams, but a calling pulls for you. Mm-hmm. And so for this, I was like, if I can just, if I can put some points on the board, make some investments, find some people to be an example, I know this can be big. I love your phrase, underestimated. Yeah. Because we always talk about we like to help underserved groups, mm-hmm. but you say underestimated. And I'm sure as a black gay woman from the South, you have a lot of experience <laughs> being underestimated. You have a great book mm-hmm. about it. Tell us what you consider underestimated. Yeah, it's so underestimated. Um, I mean, a lot of us can relate to it in very different ways. I even like this word for straight white men. Because some of, like most of them have been underestimated mm-hmm. in some ways, so they kind of they get it. They right? relate to they, it. They don't think about this every day because it's not their lived experience. But if you kind of help them relate to it, and they do have a lot of the money in Silicon Valley, so getting them on board is important to an extent, right? Um, but underestimated, I think I like to think of it as you don't see me coming. You, I will still to this day. Mm-hmm. After everything I've done, invested in 200 plus companies, raised millions of dollars, generated millions of dollars, I will still, like last week. Oh, hold I had, on. I saw this post. Let me pull it up. What? You oh, you're going to do it? <laughs> I saw this. Okay. I told you I follow you. Go ahead. I'm well, I, there's mo- multiple stories. So I don't know <laughs> which one you're going to bring. No, you go, go, go. But I will still have people like hand me their keys to their car or. Ask me where our bathroom is because I must be the help. Absolutely. Or, you know, and I could be the keynote speaker, right? Like you saw, what was it, Melanie Hobbs, who is a billionaire, a black woman, was taken through the kitchen to her own keynote because they thought she was the wait staff, right? Like that is... And that's such a negative way of thinking about it because it, it happens, it's so prevailing, but it's like, okay, if you're going to underestimate me, if you don't know what I'm capable of, let me let me watch and see, right? So there's a way to spin that, I have found. And I say you can turn it into your greatest advantage because they don't see me coming when I'm, when they don't know, they think they've pigeonholed me. It's um, an advantage and it's also um, unexpected. You touched on the fact that white men, that this they have the money, but this is something you could kind of make them relate to because everyone's been underestimated. Yeah. How did talk a little bit more about that because a black woman getting into that Silicon Valley world, you didn't mm-hmm. have the network, mm-hmm. you didn't have what they have, the old mm-hmm. boys club. How did how do you navigate that space? Yeah, someone asked me, a black woman asked me, how do I navigate white spaces? And I tell her, told her, I don't because I don't think there is a white space. I don't consider right. any space a white space. We, I believe that everyone has inherited the exact amount, same amount of the United States, if we if we live here, and the same amount of the world collectively. So all of this belongs to us, as just as much as it belongs to the next mm-hmm. person. So these you know geniuses that are supposedly out there who are the the billionaires, the only reason that they are billionaires or that they have been afforded the right to be billionaires is because the country was built on the backs of our ancestors. We were, as Pamela Jolly says, Dr. Pamela Jolly says, we came here as wealth, and we've been building wealth for the country since we arrived in this country. And so I believe now is our time to get that inheritance, to take what's ours. So you never internalize the illusion. Yeah, I. it's like the, the same thing with imposter syndrome. Like, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't have it. <laughs> like, I, I it just, I have met too many people in power to believe that they're better than I am right. or to believe that they're better, smarter than the smartest black woman I know because I'm surrounded by <laughs> genius. I'm surrounded by it. I'm surrounded by charisma and brilliance and for it to be muted simply because of the skin color or the orientation or the gender is a travesty. And so we, we have that to rail against. We don't have time for imposter syndrome because we don't have time. We have to make up for so much time. Mm-hmm. 
Well, along those lines, this hey, post. Okay, yeah, here we go. Show this here we go. <laughs> this is a different post, but it does, I think, align perfectly. And like I said, you have to follow Arlen to see all of the things that she discusses because you didn't, you don't mention the names, but you will, will talk about a circumstance. Yeah. I will sometimes drop names. Well, this, this one you did in this yeah. particular one, but you said a white man got into my comments. On another platform today, after I said that I'm a fan of DEI in response to a Mark Cuban post, that's literally all I said. Mm -hmm. And then he goes on um, to say he genuinely like he genuinely likes me, and I'm a great hype person for myself. But what about the results? How has my DEI fund done, et cetera? And so, can you talk about what happened, what you did after that, and why you felt the need to uh, share this? Yeah, I started writing him a response because I, I mean, I get it all the time right mm -hmm. so I don't respond to a lot of right. people I have a lot of patience with that but something about that just hit me like when I went to his profile and it said he lived in Malibu it said he was a film producer I'm like why do you have time for this why do you have time why do you have time to punch down as it were right and it kind of triggered I was triggered already by Elon's incessant talk about why DEI is racism and now people, other corporations coming forward and... And, and stopping their programs yeah. or going into hiding. And Mark Cuban is seems to me to be the only billionaire uh, brave enough to talk back to him. But, I mean, I think Elon is like the dumbest genius there is. Like, I, I just don't know why things come out of his mouth, except for I think he's a racist. I don't know if I can say that here, but I just think he's... You can say whatever you I want. think he's a racist, yeah. and I think... Now he gets he has the carte blanche to, to just be his full racist self, mm -hmm. and that would be fine. He can go and scream at the clouds and do all his uh, mm -hmm. shenanigans, but he is affecting people because right. he has a voice, and so th that was the kind of mind space. It touched a nerve. It touched a nerve, and so I started responding to him. But instead of responding to him, I just blocked him and I took the response to my people because I just wanted to say. I don't want you to look at my Instagram and just think everything's going perfectly. I want you to understand that every single day I have to fight trolls. I have to fight all sorts of institutions. Mm -hmm. And so what I essentially said to this man and and to other people who think like him is that th there's only one real excuse as to why you would make the time to come into my timeline and my comments over something so innocent. And it's that you if if mark cuban or if i am right and that dei is fair and that we deserve to be on equal footing and that you know if we're on equal footing we can do even better than you then you are in fear of what that means about your success mm -hmm. so as the successful i think white man you're either one or two things. You're either comfortable with yourself and you know what you got and you're happy that everybody else gets a little piece mm -hmm. well, you or feel you feel threatened and you feel like if they were to get on equal footing, they would lap me. Right. I would not be the king because my what is the emperor's clothes? Mm -hmm. Like they would know that I didn't really have this. It wasn't meritocracy. It wasn't merit based. And so the only thing I can do is rail against it and hope that I can push it back so far that they never get close enough to see what I'm really standing on. So that's when you have people who are like confident in themselves, mm -hmm. like a Mark Cuban or many right. other people who are like, I'm actually rich. I know there was some inequities. I'm doing the best that I can. I'm bringing other people with me. Yeah, and Mark Cuban was somebody who invested mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, with you. So can you tell how, how that even happened? Yeah, Mark Cuban invested a total of $6 million into yeah. my fund, and I've wow. raised about 30. So, it's so a, first a go chunk. around, it was $1 million, then $5 million? That's right. Okay. 2019 was $1 million. Mm -hmm. And what happened there was we met at South by Southwest in Austin. We spoke on the same stage. <clears throat> at the time, it was for Twitter, kind of ironically. <laughs> but we spoke on the same stage, and it went really well. Like, when we went on a, out on the stage, everybody was like, Mark, Mark, Mark. And when we left the stage, they were like, Arlen, Arlen, Arlen. So <laughs> he, saw, he saw kind of, like, how people react to me. And so I use it as, an, you know, a chance to just ask him, hey, do you want to be in my fund? And he said, no, nah, I don't really like being in other people's funds. I like to invest directly in companies because I have too much fun doing that. Why would I need somebody else to invest for me, essentially? And I was like, okay, cool. Um, then a few weeks later, a few days later, um, an article came out about me. This was 2019. An article came out about me that said my fa my fund had failed because I hadn't raised it all yet. Mm -hmm. And you got to understand, I'm around people raising funds all day long. I know the process behind the scenes. Most people's funds take a year, two, or three years to raise. So it was like they were picking on me a little bit. And 
that that um, article made some of my investors take their money out. Ooh. Is this when you you lost five million? That was a different time. I lost five million more. Okay, next one. That's crazy, right? There's a lot of. Right? A lot of <laughs> yeah. So he saw that, and like he he got the same kind of newsletter that I got, and, I, and they used a bad picture of me too. It was oh. like you know I was sad and just disheveled, <laughs> and so he without I didn't reach out to him at all. He reached out to me. He said, "Look, what we need to do is make you independently wealthy." So that you don't have to deal with this. Right. Yes. And he said, I'm going to give you a million dollars. Invest it any way you want to. She just kind of like pick you up. Like, l- let's get back up. We got stuff to do. And I just thought, that's amazing. Right. And then when um, George Floyd was murdered on live television, essentially, and we were going through that reckoning. Mm-hmm. Out of the blue, I got an email from Mark. And he does everything by email or text. And I got an email from him. And it just said, want to do more? That's all the, the subject said. And it uh, opened <laughs> it up and it said, I want to put five, five million more in. Let's go. Wow. And I was like, no, let me check my calendar. Um, I don't know if I, <laughs> no, I was like, like, I was like, let's go. <laughs> I was like, let's go. Because he understood the urgency of the moment. We need to, we need to catalyze the people who are already doing the work. And he knew that he wasn't going to jump in and know exactly who to reach out to, what founders to invest in. But he knew he could invest in somebody who would know those things because he'd already worked with me. He understood, yeah, Mm -hmm. that I had that that deal flow and everything. So he made that investment. And I will also say to his credit, like there are a lot of ways to build a fund, to structure a fund. There are ways that he could have taken more advantage of the situation. But it was his idea to give me more of the um, upside. Mm-hmm. So it's called carry, like carried interest, which is like the profit share. He said, I'm going to give you X amount of profit share, which is way more than industry standard. Wow, that's So great. it was a lot of things that he was like, you can invest in anything you want. You don't need my permission. You can invest. In that's, a, that's huge. It's now, huge. Can I ask you something just to go back to what you said earlier? Um, because I didn't want to cut off your story yeah. at all. But how did you feel when that newsletter went out with so many of your peers mm-hmm. and people in the industry that you're in? And like you said, you felt that they were picking on you, but other people may have just read the headline. Yeah, or... only the headline. So right. many people did. I would I would thank you for that because nobody's ever asked me that. Um, it was devastating to me, and I don't I don't embarrass easily. I I can fail in public real easily because I know how audacious the work I'm doing is. I know that there's going to be some failure in it, mm-hmm. and that most of the people who are criticizing that could never, right. <laughs> like, could never even attempt what Some I'm doing. people take so much pleasure in yeah. seeing other people not, yeah. you know, quote unquote, so, not succeed. So they. Think. So I will say before I answer that, I have since talked to that journalist. We've had a heart to heart, and. I have forgiven him, and he understands me a lot better. Mm-hmm. Not to say it won't happen again for right. him, but I think we had a we had like a three year period where things were not good because I talked about it in my book and everything. <laughs> but with, when it first happened, I was devastated mostly because I knew I was like, people only read headlines. Yeah, and, and that affects business. This is not so. It's going to affect my fund, and which it did. Investors say, oh, we don't like that kind of energy and we, we're worried about what's going on behind the scenes. I'm like, nothing is going on behind the scenes that I didn't tell you, right? But also, I felt like he just set us back because you're not, I'm one you're of the not few, walking alone. Right. I'm one of the very few people who got this far. Mm-hmm. And I'm an example to people, for mm-hmm. better or for worse. And I knew that responsibility. But if people are just reading the headlines and if they read what he wrote, I mean, he even went so far in right. that article. And they don't hear it from me, they're going to say, yeah, we told you. We mm-hmm. told you we couldn't put money there. And I thought, how much damage, we'll never know how much damage that article did to the whole movement. Mm. So I was devastated in multiple ways. And then personally, I felt like you're damned if you do, if you're damned if you don't. Like all this work I just did for the past, what, six years at that point? The things that people will never know about, the, the moving all kinds of money from my account into other people's account to make investments, to make payroll, that I'll never see some of the fruits of my own labor. Mm -hmm. All of that sacrifice that I do behind the scenes to this day, that's why I had like that moment too with that that, uh, post. I thought he just, with one fell swoop, he just messed it up. And he doesn't know me. Right. Like he doesn't know me at all. And he needed some, I felt like he needed something. But when we had the conversation, we know we, we definitely walked it through. Ooh, that was a lot. I can't even. I just ask that because I know sometimes, you know, just from 
uh, just the way that you just told that, that is exactly what I was thinking, how that could feel. Like, emotionally, it's like, this is your baby. Mm -hmm. And so that's yeah. hard. But that's why I feel like you've also said that, um, you know, accumulating wealth is also a form of activism. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I love how, you, love how you see wealth building as activism and your investment in empowering. You think you want to create a thousand millionaires this yeah. year. Activism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Over the next decade. That's why I wrote Your First Million as kind of the kickoff of that. And I mean, we know that a thousand million equals a billion and we can be upset with billionaires if they exist and what they do with it. But it, the truth is, if they, if you have a billion dollars or more, and you want to do something or you want to say something, it gets out to the world. Right. It's just, it's a, it's, it is a platform on its own. So my thought was, believe me, I want to see some more black billionaires. That's, I'm not trying to stop that. But what I'm saying is, we can also, anybody listening to this, could also be a millionaire. So what if we collectively built our wealth? and then work together towards something greater. Like if we wanna see something in the world happen, what if we were the ones that made that happen? So I, I just think if you if we say the billionaire word, it just seems so unattainable because mm -hmm. millions seem attain unattainable to most people. But I know now after interviewing hundreds of, of uh, millionaires, after working with hundreds of millionaires, maybe thousands at this point, and after becoming one, I know that it can be taught yeah, and I know that it can that it is possible for so many people. Ninety nine point nine percent of people. I'm gonna tell you, a million dollars doesn't seem as like as much as it used to. It really is <laughs> not. You're joking. It, it, it isn't. It's not. It, it, doesn't. it definitely doesn't. You know, some people feel like people who are billionaires are evil. Like they yeah, have exactly. had to do evil things, yeah. uh, heartless things, to get to that position. Yeah. What would you say to that? I've seen that conversation happen so many times on I social media. I have seen that, too, yeah. Um, that come, came up on my brother's show, I think, too. Um, oh, we got to talk about your brother yeah, in a second. Yeah, it came up on one of his <laughs> interviews. Um, I So this is tough for me because I, we'll, we will never know what happens behind closed doors of places. I, I think there's, like, the I'm leaning more towards that has to be the truth. And it may not be evil, per se, right. but there are people under the thumb of other people, right? Like if you think about certain companies or certain people, who works for them? What sacrifices were made? What, you know, cost cutting measures were made so that you could have that profit margin higher? Um, I just happen to work with Cuban, so I know what like what I believe a, a good quote unquote billionaire is, but I don't know his life behind the scenes. Right. I don't mm -hmm. know the cutthroat negotiations. Yeah, business wise, you do have to do some cutthroat things yeah, at times. Yeah, that can feel heartless. That can, but it has to sometimes be it's a business decision is from. different from an emotional. Yeah. That's why I think we sh we should have more more wealth mm -hmm. because then we can instead of only complaining we can say, okay, this is what I want to do about it. That's why I started Backstage Capital, so I could be the one writing a check while yelling at people, <laughs> right? So it just, I feel like we have more, mm -hmm. more of a leg to stand on if we're also coming to the table with collective wealth. Let's talk about Backstage for a minute. You've mm -hmm. raised over $30 million. You invest, like all venture capitalists, mm -hmm. in what you consider to be high potential founders. Mm -hmm. How does someone who's smart, well-intentioned, has a good idea, move from being just someone who's smart, well, and has a good yeah. idea to a high potential founder? What makes someone someone you want to invest in? I tell you, there's so many- and I'm taking notes, yeah. so go ahead. We, first of all, <laughs> let me say that we invest in less than 1% of what we see, just because of numbers, we see so many companies. Right. If you go to backstagecapital.com, you can apply for investment. If you feel like you're ready, like take a look at it and say, am I ready for this or do I want to wait or whatever? But you, we look at every single uh, application. But because of the numbers and the stats, like we're, if we say no to you or if we don't get back to you, it's nothing to do with your company necessarily. You have to be able to, to surpass our no. But there's also so much you have control over. Like, for instance, somebody could come to, to us or to me and say, I want to raise $100,000 because X, Y, Z. And I'll say, okay, cool. Um, what What is your product? And they'll say, well, I haven't put the product out because I haven't raised. <laughs> I'll say, okay, well, how many people on the waiting list for the product? Because I know you've talked about it. No, I haven't done that because I haven't raised, right? There are so many steps you could take before you even get to an investor. Right. Even one who is, like, seeing you as a full person, like I am. And you can do things like survey 
an audience of you've, you've there's been a time I don't know if I'm aging myself but we used to mm-hmm. walk outside of movies at some point <laughs> yes, early movies and they would take that. a survey of like how did you like the movie because they're they're kind of <laughs> collecting information you can take surveys of your audience do you have an audience have you built some sort of uh, of a community base. a base yeah. like yeah. what what makes you think people like this and so I like I love when people come to me and say yeah, I haven't raised anything, or our, we have we're pre-product and pre-revenue, but we have surveyed a thousand people over the past twelve months, and we have tweaked this and that, so we know how to spend that money once we get it. Or we've done some paid advertising, so we know if we put a dollar in, we get three out. So all we need to do is add fuel to the fire. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things you can do before you even come to me that tell me that you're serious about this. Another thing to note is I look at. What have you done so far with the resources you have? Right. That is how I'm, I'm not putting everybody on the same um, footing because you're not necessarily on the same footing as the next person. Because somebody who lives in Tulsa or somebody who lives in Oakland or whatever is going to they're going to see life a little bit differently depending on how, th- how much things cost. Because for some of people, it is a million dollars is huge. Yeah. And getting X, Y, Z is huge to others. It's like. It's a different quality of life. Out I wasn't here. saying it's not huge, by the way. No, I, no. <laughs> I know, but but I know New what you're York saying. City, it's, it's not, not sometimes. what we used to think. It, a million dollars <laughs> used, used to, to seem be like crazy. if I had a million done. dollars, I never got to do anything again. Like yeah, I that's not how life is. Retire. People living to be a hundred anymore. <laughs> all that's taken care of. The I parents wanna, and the so kids. you know, along those lines, do you think that it's important to see that somebody's invested their own money into? their startup before you say because I've always felt like I want to see what have you invested in yourself yeah. to make me feel comfortable enough to know that I should invest yeah and you're an investor right you're an angel investor right no not um first of all I want to we're going to get to that in okay, a second okay. too but I, I that's part of why I follow you because at some point yeah um that's the position I want to be in but yeah. first I'm trying to take care of some things financially on my end so yeah. I can do that and be able to raise money but also put my own in happy to, to talk start about to, that yeah well so when you say invest money, yes and no. Sometimes people don't have the money to invest. Like I didn't have the money to invest in my fund at the beginning, but I still had everything else that I invested. Mm-hmm. Time and research and all the blood, sweat, it's and tears. not just a financial. Yeah, yeah, so I want you to have invested something. Right. It doesn't have to be pure hard cash, but if it is, give me the, give me the story. Like what have you, how long have you been working on this? Why you? Why now? Why this? All of that is going to help inform if this is something that you think I'm going to make some money off of it, mm-hmm. so I'm going to start it, or if it's something that's like I can't live. This is oxygen. To Can me. you give us an example in real life of uh, an investment that you've made? Oh, many investments. Yeah, give us one example that will show, like, exemplify. What you're looking for. This is how they came to Mm -hmm. me, and this is why I felt like backstage would be. Well, I would say we've invested in everything from hair products to uh, objects in space that are satellites that are flying around. So (laughs) I'll tell you, but one thing that uh, hits home right this moment is Curl Mix. Y'all know Curl Mix? Mm -hmm. So Kim and Tim are a black couple uh, from Chicago, and I met Tim 2017 after I did like a public speaking thing for the first time, which is a whole other story. Mm-hmm. And he told me that he said they were mixing hair products in their kitchen and they were they had like a subscription box. And I was like, that's cool for curly hair. And then he told me that they didn't have any investors and the way that they were able to even get it that far. And they were making like ten thousand dollars a month, hmm. which is usually what you don't really you can't really get venture funding like that. But it was something to me. I was like, ears perked up because you did something. Yeah. And then he said that the way that they were able to fund it thus far was that Kim watched him play uh, on a, what did he, well, he was playing like, who wants to be a millionaire on t- <laughs> Like he was just on his couch. <laughs> and he was answering all the questions correctly. So she went online as they were there and filled out an application and he got on the show <laughs> and he won two hundred and fifty thousand. Get oh out. My goodness. That's amazing. Get out. So they used most of that money to, <laughs> to fund start their to start business. He is God's chosen so, one. Right. So, <laughs> so you're i I'm sitting there and I'm listening and he's telling me how incredible Kim is as a CEO, how she is making moves that you wouldn't necessarily know someone would know to make at this stage. And how and how the way he talked about her and how they work together. And they were a young family, and I was like, "There's something here." And I, he, mm. they, they were like, "We just can't get in front of investors. And everybody's taking us seriously." I'm like, "You put your own money in. You won it off a game. Like this is a movie, <laughs> right?" 
So I gave them, I was first their mentor, and then I gave them $25,000. They used the $25,000 to hire part-time help at a, and then get a little bit of space at a factory so they didn't have to do it out of the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Fast forward, Not only reason I'm taking a little bit of credit of this is because Kim has said multiple times that they wouldn't be here if that didn't happen. Fast forward, they did something between 7 and $10 million in the last 12 months. Yes. Wow. <laughs> and they have their own factory, and they have incredible amount of, of employees, and it's a, it is a thriving enterprise. And they have raised millions of dollars, and they have generated millions of dollars. Who wants to be a multimillionaire? That's yes. incredible. They're in Ulta Beauty. Um, it, they're just killing it and I'm going to get to see them in a couple of days and it's just story after story after story if like you know you walk into a Silicon Valley venture capitalist office and say I want to do something for curly hair and they had their natural hair both of them have really beautiful natural hair walking they're going to be like what are you talking about right. like get out of here <laughs> where's yeah. your SaaS product I, I, don't, I need a fintech product but there was just something I saw in them and I believe they're going to you know, be one of the groups that makes me very, very wealthy, even wealthier. That's awesome. If someone doesn't win a game show mm-hmm. <laughs> and just has a little bit of money to invest <laughs> in their business, what do you suggest they do with it? I really believe that the very first thing you should think about is hiring a fractional, or you can call it part-time or, or contract, executive assistant type who can free up the CEO's time, and that you may be a solopreneur, or just you, but can free up your time from the menial tasks and the minutia so that that CEO can do what they do best, which should be sales, maybe fundraising if you go that route, and customer service. So a lot of people, and I've studied this with a lot of companies, they'll spend 20 plus hours a week invoicing or talking to someone on the phone or doing things that or like posting or doing things that very important things Mm -hmm. and I said menial but I probably the wrong phrasing they're very important things but they're tedious and they can be done by someone who loves doing that stuff right and can do it all day long but you can hire them for five hours a week ten hours a week a little by little right and you can start taking that off your plate so that you then can put the same 10, 5, 20 hours, imagine if like the thing that brings you the most opportunity, if you're able to do that 20 times the amount of times you can do it today or two times, <laughs> it would just bring more opportunity back. Yeah, being able to delegate uh, is also an important quality because sometimes you feel like if I don't do it, it's not going to get done right. Like those, It's true. And, and, Can I tell you that that's true, though? Yeah. It's not going to get done the way you want it to because they're not you. But as multiple people have said that I've studied... <laughs> Is it an okay, isn't it better to have somebody do something 80% as well as you do if it means you can go out there and do what you do best yeah. at the full capacity? Mm-hmm. So write, you they're not going to write that newsletter as perfectly as you would have because right. it's not your voice. Ooh. But they're going to get you close enough so you can be over here having the meeting with the Fortune 500 company. Or you can gonna, get some AI. You and- can do that too, yeah. <laughs> To you use your com- voice. You can combine yeah. it, right? Yeah. I just think that <laughs> that is such a like a great investment early on that people, mm-hmm. and you don't have to wait too long to do it. And I just meet so many founders who are just inundated. Yeah. They're like, and they're, or they're late to meetings and stuff. And I'm like, why because are Because they have, I, um, black female entrepreneurs. Black female founders spend about four to five hours a week, I read, chasing unpaid invoices. There you go. Look at that. See? A week. So have somebody who really likes <laughs> to week. shake people down. Like, <laughs> like, I think it's a time. Yeah. No, I'm outside your <laughs> office now. <laughs> yeah. You all know who I'm talking about. No, I'm kidding. And Arlen, your brother's here, too, and I want to make sure that we acknowledge that this yeah. is an important time for him. You, have a, just... you must have a very happy mother. Oh, yeah. yes. And she's doing her thing, too. So we're, we're, Yeah, we wanted to, but your brother's yeah, here, and I just want to acknowledge out. why this yes. is an important time. So my brother say hi, Rook. Hey, what's up with it? Hey. Didn't you just have, have a few smooth? downloads or something? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to say what he, what happened today. Shout so him out. He just got, he just reached 250 million views on YouTube through his show, Real Life Street Stars. 250 Real life million Street views. Stars. Y'all heard about Real it. Life Y'all know Street. Real Life. And so, yeah, you want to say anything about it? Come sit. You can hey. sit in the camera. Where are y'all? Where I need to be at. Right here. Oh, yeah. Where you want to, where you're in Dallas? Yeah. Yeah, Just Dallas, tell us Texas. about your show. Real Life Street Stars, famous blue couch with the light wall in the background. Yes. Well, who are a couple people you've had on recently? Um, You know, 
Charleston White, <laughs> uh, Mark Cuban, yeah. Jaguar Wright, you know, the famous interview with Jaguar Wright. Yeah. The whole gamut, okay? <laughs> they, they do the whole gamut. Yeah. <laughs> Soon to have it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Charleston yeah. White to Mark Cuban. I would yeah. love to see y'all on that show. Um, we would, too. Yeah, y'all just come down there in Dallas. <laughs> Get yeah, y'all famous like well, yeah. anytime you Because we hear you, your voice in the background, but yeah. we don't want. What's that? Deci- I'm sorry, I'm taking. I'm like, oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> what's the decision to be off camera? Like, why did y'all make that decision? <laughs> so nobody can mess it up. Oh. <laughs> someone gets the big head or something, though. The show's always going to go on. Yeah, so it's, yes. it's not about y'all, it's, it's about, about your them. guests. Yeah, it's about the guests all, all the time. I think that's a, a real good key for success, right? Because yeah. you, you figured out what exactly it needed to be to reach the $250 million. And I have to say, it took 13 years, but the last two years is where you got most of the views. Oh, that yeah. consistency really matters. People never know when that's going to happen. Did Backstage Capital, and uh, I know somebody Uh-oh, from there she that put can actually... Spot. She put <laughs> on the spot get an investment well I, I think one of the biggest <laughs> investments was getting Mark Cuban on the couch and that much that is that. an investment I, I did that yeah, yeah. I, I got I got him on there and and we, we've it. talked about it before but they're they've stayed independent because I try to tell as many founders as I can including my own family stay independent as long as you can so you can have more control you can ha- you can sell pieces of your company for more mm-hmm. rather than when you when you first started you're at the mercy of the investor. Right. So they built up something they they can ask for anything right now. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, if you do so if you try to get that investment too early, you're giving up a lot for very little money. That's it. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. Well congratulations. We're proud of you, bro. Well, I appreciate and it. And tell Thank people you. your your um your handle so they can oh, find at you. Real life rook and you know, uh real life street stars. With, with a Z. Z. With a Y and a Z. Yeah. Oh, Real life. Yeah. Whole, what, what, now, your mom, you said the whole family's lit. What so is, my mom is Miss Erlene Sims. She is 74. And at 74, she started her own eyewear line. At 74 years old. At 74, old. she has six designs. Every time we do a pop-up anywhere, we just did a pop-up in Puerto Rico, Napa, everywhere, she sells out. And uh, Katy Perry has a pair. Oprah has a pair. Wow. She's just because she she's so stylish and she was always wearing other people's glasses and they would stop her in the airport, stop her everywhere. We love your look. And finally, she was like, let me just do my own <laughs> my own line. And so was this the glasses your sister-in-law was wearing? No, she was. Well, okay. we have a whole thing about that because that's Uh-oh. that's in the okay, car. Forget we, it. Just yeah, we just scratch that. <laughs> but no, no. You know, we, we, you are allowed to wear anything you want. <laughs> Angel. <laughs> no, but she so she has six pairs. My mom is wearing a pair, um, and we're like we're literally like sold out. So we get another another group sent to us because it keeps you know we keep depleting the the resources. So you are you. Your brother has this crazy podcast. Yeah. Your mom has this glasses line. Yeah. You guys didn't grow up in a wealthy family with everyone teaching you how to do this. And Not I love this is one of my favorite lines from your book. If I can find it, I can't even see it now. When you're looking for someone to emulate and you can't find anyone you can relate to, take that as a sign that the person you're looking for might be yourself. Mm. Lean on that because a lot of us are told, you know, you can't be it if you can't see it. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have any role models yeah. wanted to be black financial journalists. There was nobody who looked like me. There's nobody who looked like us when we wanted to create this financial yeah. platform. You don't always have to see it to be it. That's exactly right. I don't believe in that. You have to see it to believe it or to be it. Um, exactly what you're saying. I, I think that we sometimes have to be our own heroes because nobody's coming to save us. Mm-hmm. So we sometimes have to be the first. And you that does it. mean, what did they say, that there's going to be arrows in the back? Oh, yeah, when you're, you're the first at yeah. something. So it does mean those things we talked about and the kind of pressure and the trolls. But it, I can't tell you how fulfilling it is to have every single day of my life to have people tell me either online or in person, usually through tears, that I've changed their life or have helped them in such a meaningful way. And that, those that's because of seeds planted what, back when I thought everything was not working out that's because of seeds planted when I was at the airport because of the perseverance because of the grit those things have happened and so I cannot help but to say it was all worth it and people are going to actually be able to hear see and work with you in person oh yeah now I'm excited about this because I see you have some all-stars please be my guest so come on tell us about it so I have your first million live happening in uh, April 9th through the 12th in Los Angeles at LA Live Go to yourfirstmillion.live to see the tickets. I'll give you a, a really great discount if you use the word live as your discount code. That's an easy Because to you heard this live. here. Um, we are having, so we're having an evening with Issa Rae. 
She's going to talk to us from the Peacock Theater, which is where the Emmys were just held. That's like, fancy. This is gorgeous. Yes, gorgeous building. And I love listening to Issa Rae talk. She has been. She has gems. Yeah. yeah. Okay, she, go ahead. She's amazing. So a living legend. We'll mm-hmm. have Issa. We have Rich Paul, mm-hmm. who's in the building. Clutch uh, Sports. Yes. Okay. Bronze agent and much, much more. We have Miss Sheila Johnson, the first Ooh. black woman billionaire mm-hmm. I know that's in the right. country. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk will be there, teach us all about marketing ourselves. Gary V. We're going to have um, Janelle James, who is Ava on Abbott Elementary, oh, the, the principal. She's comedian. hosting. She's hosting yes. the event. Oh, that's going to oh, be that's so good. awesome. Isn't that great? I, I, I hope she comes and carries her like that. No. <laughs> I just think she's going to just principal. kill it. Yeah, she's going to kill. She's going to probably cuss me out for being so early in the morning. She's going to do all <laughs> kinds of stuff. And then we have TLC, the legendary TLC, will be closing out the event, um, and and a, with a full concert. Yeah, because they're on tour. They've been doing this. Um, yeah, they're I on just tour. They Australia. just yeah, they had to unfortunately cancel a few dates. So we're gonna keep a, a peak. You know, T Boz is so important to me and so special to me, mm-hmm. and we're keeping an eye on her health. Whatever she needs, we're making that happen. We definitely have some friends of hers who will come through if things don't work out. But I'm so excited for TLC. Yes, and me how too. do people sign up for that again? If you go to your first million dot live. And then use the code live for any of the ticket uh, ticket tiers. And let me tell you, it's not just uh, watching people. We're also going to have Arlen's Academy in real life. You'll be able to learn from our experts. And you'll be able to experience things. Bring your family. Bring everybody with you. And you talk about networking. This is a great opportunity. This is it. Yeah. I, I mean, there's. I, I know that when I go to a conference or to an event, I don't want to sit there and just listen to people. I want to meet the people who could be my future partners. Yeah. I want access to people in the room who have made their first million. You're going to be among many of my investors. Mm-hmm. Like so many people who have invested in Backstage and just in my life are going to be at, at the event, walking among you, talking, collaborating. And I say you meet if you can meet two or three really strong people who you keep a relationship with, it's already worth it. Yeah, absolutely. And also get the book. OK, your, your first, first million. You got your first million live. You got your first million book. Follow Arlen on Instagram. I love her Instagram handle. Arlen was here. Yeah. <laughs> and if you think we are ever letting you get out of Wealth Wednesday orbit, you are incorrect. <laughs> so you will be back Thanks, very soon. Okay. Shop at gyms. But we're just so happy. Thank you. And I'd love to talk to you about your angel investing world. We'll talk about that offline because yes. I definitely want to. I'm be in my as early, early stages, but I'll tell you everything because mm-hmm. I know for me, that's definitely my next step. And I've said that, like, what is. Uh, philanthropy and also investing looking like for me moving forward mm-hmm. and being able to do more for other people. So mm-hmm. that's um, really the goal yeah. to get I'm gonna to save that you point. a lot of money too. Okay, I'm gonna save you a lot of heartache. And Y'all heard of here yeah. first. <laughs> yeah, she'll be great at it. She is authentically wonderful. It'll be great. All right. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate you on this Wealth Wednesday. 